So that's the roadmap. So now I have 25 slides just about the roadmap. Are you ready? <laughs> Allez. No, I have only one. Because you all know about it. Uh, it was launched in that very same room uh, 18 months ago with that objective of reducing cholera deaths by 90%. By 2030, eliminating disease transmission, transmission in at least 20 countries. Um, I have to say, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, and I've been on that, like some of you in the room, in that business of, uh, if I may speak like this, of cholera for many years. And actually, that's the first time we see that strong engagement on, on cholera, in my view, at that scale, at, at the global level. I listed a few countries here, a few some some results. I may have missed some and maybe not be perfect, but um, we have countries in the Horn of Africa, uh, as well as Zambia, Zimbabwe, uh, the Zanzibar representative is here as well. So they're all launching elimination plans at various stages. Zambia is very well advanced, for example, Zanzibar as well. Tanzania is not here, but they are still starting, uh, initiating work. So that's something which is would not happen that, that easily before. And, and my perception that in some of those countries, at least, this is a very pragmatic approach. And uh, we see in, in a place like in Zanzibar that multi-sectoral, um, cross-sector coordination, same thing in Zimbabwe, they have put the leadership of the cholera plan under the, is it the vice president or the prime minister, yeah. for example. We have several representatives from AT here. Can I touch wood somewhere? You have no cases reported now since several weeks. Um, so you are making very, very significant progress in, uh, in disease burden in AT and you've launched last week your, the final phase of the elimination plan. So we're in a good direction towards success also there. Although of course, the living conditions and wash in particular remains uh, put the country still at risk. Uh, we have a number of countries which have also launched very broad, large-scale uh, OCV campaigns like DRC, Uganda, although it's a bit stalled there. Nigeria could have put here as, as well South Sudan. With, with great, great success, uh, not everywhere, uh, and with some problems in implementation in particular, but. Clearly, the vaccine has, has played a key role in, in creating that, that dynamic, I think, as is shown very clear result. We have colleagues here from Bangladesh, I think, yeah. Uh, and I was, I don't know, for those who were here last June, we had the Secretary General of Health, Bangladesh, uh, with us, and he was openly speaking of cholera. This is something which will never, ever happen before. Uh, we asked, I think we'll, so very soon see the same uh, result in, in a country like Ethiopia, which is also making some efforts in, in recognizing that maybe there is a problem there. And if you want to address it, the first thing is to recognize it, right? So all those blockages seem to be disappearing little by little, recognizing that cholera is not something that you just, okay, it's a lost cause. I have cholera every year, that's it. Uh, les hirondelles reviennent au printemps, you say in French, no idea in English, but uh, like a fatality, you know. That's, that's, things are very much changing, and I think I've put a few slides here. To, I love this slide from, Mor from Mauricio, I think it's yours, right? Uh, Serpa, no? Uh, it is with the colors per year, uh, the cases in 80. Uh, honestly, I mean, if you compare with the figure they had in 2011, 12, etc., the, the, the progress are striking. Uh, Somalia, I mean, we had, uh, if, I didn't put the slide here, but we had cases over and over again every year in Somalia. They've launched very large uh, OCV campaigns. And uh, 2000, for example, 2017 was dramatic there. As, as uh, Fran was saying, this was a sort of sub-regional outbreak. We, did, we all focused on Yemen, but they had 75,000 cases and 1,000 deaths in Somalia. It's probably the same outbreak. Djibouti had a large outbreak. They didn't declare it, but uh, when, when you discuss with them, their, their hospitals were full of patients. And last year, 6,000 cases, maybe by chance, but they also vaccinated at large, at large scale, something like one or two million people. And today, they only have uh, ongoing transmission in the province of Mogadishu, which I will vaccinate. 
Uh, remember the, the Rohingya uh, crisis in uh, forgot when it was. Right? Those people uh, moving to to uh, Bangladesh and the country was very reactive. Like we have no representatives from Mozambique, but Mozambique in the last few weeks was also super reactive. They've seen that in in Bangladesh was a rival of refugees in an area endemic for cholera. In Mozambique, the floodings, uh, they lots of destruction. Kate is just back from there high risk of cholera, and we had an explosive outbreak, uh, immediately the request for, for vaccine came. Uh, and the result we see in uh, uh, France may be a bit optimistic. I, I hope they will control it. Uh, we still had 4,000 cases, something like this. In, in Bangladesh, we were successful. We had no cholera outbreak, even undeclared. Uh, the reactivity for OCV campaign, early detection of the outbreak, and the role here of the capacity to early detect and confirm is super important. Uh, we had recently a case in a DRC where we received the, the request for vaccine uh, last month, four months after the beginning of the outbreak. It's too late. South Sudan, our friend Joseph is here, he will tell us more, but they've stopped. They have a countrywide outbreak for three or four years, something like that, which they stopped at the end of 2017, didn't come back yet. Nigeria, something similar huge transmission all across the northern part of the country, spilling over to Cameroon, spilling over to Niger as well. Uh, today, the transmission has stopped, particularly in Borno State, which is a very unstable place, uh, and we ship 6.2 million doses of vaccine. So my impression is we, with the size of the campaigns, we start seeing today some impact in terms of public health. We have the, our, our colleagues from, from Harare as well here, same thing, very reactive. The outbreak started, everybody was feared of seeing again a new episode in Zimbabwe like we had in 2008. It's not the case. Um, we vaccinated 1.2 million people. We just completed the second round about a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, but more importantly, the, the country has also used that opportunity to say, guys, that's enough. We shouldn't have outbreaks like this every X years. Uh, so they have engaged on long-term control, uh, multi-sectoral with WASH activities, with very strong support from the Higher Life Foundation. But you will tell us more. But we had a case here in Zimbabwe, like we had in, in, uh, in Zanzibar a couple of years ago, in Zambia the year before, uh, of a situation, an outbreak used as an opportunity to also engage the country on, on longer-term control. At the same time, we have a number of uh, engagement of donors and partners. Uh, of course, I have to start by our host, the Fondation Merieu. Every, every, every time it's a pleasure to come here and, and, and thank you very much to, for the way you organize the meeting, Secretary. If there's any complaint, please refer to our colleagues over there, but I don't think you will have any bit more warmer, a bit warmer, but it will be perfect. So come back in June. Uh, no, that's a great place, and their support is, is, is very important for us. Uh, we have very, the, team, the team of WHO in Geneva is here. We are all here. Kate, David, Lorenzo, that's it. So organizing meetings when you know the WHO administrative procedures would be a nightmare for us. It's very super, super helpful. CDC is here as well, uh, uh, represented, and they are offering lots of technical support in countries for those plans that countries are starting to establish to eliminate or control cholera. This is super helpful. We have two colleagues from the lab as well who are doing tremendous work in helping the GTFCC working collectively. UNICEF is engaged, are brilliantly represented here by, by Monica, uh, who is helping us in the coordination of the WASH working groups. They've dedicated a lot of resources for the investment case as well that uh, Melissa will present later on, take an aspirin before because there are lots of numbers there. Um, but it's very interesting. She will, she will go very slowly, huh, Melissa? Voila, comme d'habitude. Um, we have no IFRC reps, but they have launched uh, last week, on 6th of April, their one wash project. They are targeting 20 countries. They've got lots of funds from the um, Islamic uh, Fund. I uh, forgot the exact name, but it's an Islamic fund. Uh, they got something like more than 100 million, and they are targeting the hotspots. So that's very nice. We have 
that approach where we are dispatching and delivering a lot of vaccines and a key partner, there are many others, but in particular the, the, the IFRS, it's, it's really multi-country targeting the same areas with, with WASH uh, projects, so to ensure the, the sustainability of the control. We, of course, have a lot of NGOs uh, supporting the implementation of OCV campaigns, MSF recently supporting the campaign in, in Mozambique, for example, but many others supported in, in South Sudan, in particular. Uh, the Gates Foundation that continues to support the Secretariat, together with others, we've managed, I think, to increase a little bit our portfolio of, of donors. Uh, Gavi continues to support the OCV. Uh, for the moment, it's for two years, but they will decide in June if they, if they continue to uh, uh, support on a longer term. Um, they also support us with technical assistance and in, in country during implementation of campaigns and, and with surveillance activities, one of the key uh, donors of our group. As Fran mentioned, Wellcome Trust is now fully engaged on supporting research on cholera together with DFID. Uh, we had the first call for proposal in no November um, and they are now granting the, the, the research institutions. There will be more. Um, and an interest that there will be a session, by the way, uh, we have our annual meeting early June and then the following day we'll have a research meeting organized by Wellcome Trust. Uh, and the beauty of it is that we're trying to put together on the same table of discussion, the researchers and the country, so that the research activities are very much responding to country needs. Uh, for those who are at the US-Japan meeting in Hanoi uh, in February, you could see it's not always the case. So that's super important and that sort of interaction. And of course, what we can see is that the development donors uh, uh, supporting WASH in countries more and more tend to really focus on WASH and on the hotspot. And the investment case will be here a very important tool in terms of advocacy for us to show that it's much more worthwhile. And the, the, I forgot always in, in English, bank, bank for the buck. Anyway, the, the cost-benefit ratio is much more interesting uh, when you target the hotspot. And we are going to use investment case for for, for that as well. Bon, les gars, uh, it is not all beautiful. There is it's sunny day, but it's a bit cold. Uh, in a sense that this is the map we have used from from the Johns Hopkins. Thanks to them for the when we launched the roadmap to say those are the hotspots. We use this. I mean, you remember we we did that a little bit in a hurry and. As Fran was saying, we still have a lot of uncertainties on where those hotspots are. There's a lot of difference between one from one country to the other. We have seen some countries not represented today in the room who just came up with completely uh, overestimated figures. The more hotspots you get, the more OCV and, and funds you get as well. I suspect this, and to be a bit blunt here, but we need to be as Fran was saying, much more clear and on what is our spot, right? And, and come up with something which is very practical for in-country use. It's not about research, it's about targeting the right places for your cholera control interventions. And it cannot be 65% of the country, right? It has to be something like five, six, otherwise it means the entire country is a very, in a very bad situation, with the exception of some key countries, uh, con specific countries like uh, Yemen today, which is more and more difficult. What is the disease burden? How are we going to measure the impact of the roadmap if we have no clue uh, on, on, on where are the, the, the areas to target in priority? So there's lots of time tomorrow, but as Fran was saying, fully agree with him, it's, it's very key. The second one is about the, the question of surveillance and, um, and how we, we we use the data to decide on our interventions. And today is the most obvious example is, is Yemen. Uh, if you are following that, that a little bit, uh, everybody say, wow, 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 we have an increase again of cases in Yemen. And it's true that if you look at the AP curve on the bottom here, it's increasing. But look, we had since the beginning of the year up to 7th of April, we had almost 200,000 cases, 400 deaths. To start with, 0.2% CFR in a place like Yemen, it's great. So we all know that it's probably an overestimation of cases. But not only this, if you look at the number of affected districts, you see that almost all districts are affected. 
Is it true? Is it not true? I have my friend here from, from Emro. Maybe you have the solution here because we are looking for it since many years. We cannot target 280 districts in Yemen. So we need a much better estimate on where are to... If, if there is first a real increase of cases, probably, but where? And where are we only going to target? And in particular today, in the case of Yemen, where are we going to uh, use the vaccines they have in stock? They have 1.2 million doses in stock. Uh, I'm not sure they're going to use. They are using huge quantities of RDTs. Uh, Marie-Laure was speaking of our notes on RDTs. It is beautifully written. It's on the website. But you have a country like Yemen and some others <coughs> using thousands and thousands of RDTs. That's, I don't think that's what is in the note. So trying to uh, make that guidance well-written, agreed upon is one thing. Getting it applied in a country is another thing. There are lots of RDTs, positive, of course, in that situation. But if you look at the number of culture, it's only 2,000, which is about 1% of the total suspected cases. So how are we going to decide on priority in such, with such data? So the, the, the capacity of early detection, early confirmation, um, capacity to better target intervention based on surveillance data, AP and lab, today is missing uh, in many of those countries. It's not easy to work in, in Yemen. It's not easy to work in, in South Sudan or in, uh, or in Somalia. But here, clearly, uh, we need much better tool. The RDT uh, pre-qualification process was done in June 2017. As far as I know, there is one RDT being developed by uh, ICDDRB. Um, but that's about it. But I know we'll tell us more. But you see, we really need much better capacity on the ground. Uh, with better tool and better use, first better use of the tool we have and, and better tools as well. So this group is critical for the implementation of the roadmap, capacity to improve surveillance, capacity to monitor progress. If we do the surveillance we have today, it's going to be a bit, a bit difficult to, to measure impact of our interventions in particular. We have no idea, by the way, how many people were vaccinated in Yemen? One million? about a <laughs> significant number of people, more than a million people. We have no idea of the impact of those campaigns. No idea. Do we? Do we? Zero. Zero. Gavi can come back to us and say, guys, what are you doing with this one? Not, not saying it's easy, but here we, there is large area for improvement. So, um, again, and the plan is really to support the countries, the pointy end of the ship, the countries, uh, and that's how we can, uh, uh, that's our priority. And, and we have a few, by the way, we are a bit late because of delayed flight, but we are trying to invite as, as many countries as possible. It's not always easy because of visa and that sort of things, but that, that's critical. Particularly at the time where they are investing, they are engaging, so we need to support them. Um, at the global level, we improve the coordination. We cannot manage something like this uh, with four people at WHO. We have we need re at the HQ and what? How many? Uh, I don't have even uh, more than uh, I have Vincent in, in, in Africa and, uh, and my colleagues are not doing only cholera. So it's very weak. We need much stronger coordination and leadership capacity. We'll have the same committee meeting for the first time in June, uh, which will be a very important first step. We have a big problem with the vaccine supply. Um, today we are in negative of, uh, I don't know, many million doses of vaccine 10 million, 12. Um, with a huge demand and no increase in production capacity. Dependent very much, the producers are waiting for the Gavi decision which we will make in June and hopefully increase afterwards, hopefully. Uh, but for the moment, we have big problems here um, and are obliged to delay campaigns or refuse requests, which are sometimes relatively well justified. Uh, and then I mentioned already investment case. Melissa will get us through the, 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 the result. This is super interesting. Uh, and that's something we can use a lot for advocacy purposes. It's a good deal. Okay, that's it, boss. That's it, boss. Over to you. Thank you. <laughs>